Thanks. Thanks, Peter, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. And as Peter just mentioned, he just gave me a great setup. I'm going to be talking about these adverse event reporting systems at the FDA and how we can help. Uh, we, we do indeed have a UCSF Stanford FDA Center of Excellence for Regulatory Science. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively new effort, a couple of years old. Uh, and the idea is to help the FDA in the area of regulatory science, not policy. We don't touch policy. But re what is regulatory science? Well, it's the science necessary so that FDA regulators who are making decisions can make good decisions, better decisions, faster decisions. So it's really about facilitating them. It's about the mission of the FDA. So unlike a lot of the research in my lab and other labs at Stanford and UCSF, this is not really curiosity driven, uh, unless you count the curiosity of the FDA regulators as the driving uh, curiosity in this effort. So I want to tell you about one project within, within this uh, CIRCE, and it, it has to do with pharmacovigilance and spontaneous reports. Um, there is a database called the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System, or FAIRS. And FAIRS gets these reports, as Peter just described, from physicians, from companies, from pharmacists, even from patients. And in fact, in 2015, there were 1.7 million reports submitted to the FDA um, about drug uh, effects that were worrisome and might be adverse events. And just to give you a, paint a little picture of what these reports look like, they have some demographics, the uh, sex of the patient, the age, all the medications that the patient's on, all the diseases that the patient has, all the side effects that the patient experienced, and then some outcomes like death, lost time at work, and a few other categories. Now, of course, as Peter also mentioned, we count on these being as best effort, but we don't always know if there's best effort, so we don't always know all the drugs the patient's on, all the diseases they have, or all the side effects. But the idea is that with these reports, FDA reviewers can kind of watch this stream of reports coming in, and they have a very important job then. Their job is to detect signals that some drug or drug combination is causing big-time problems. Uh, and they don't have to prove it, but they have to flag it so that others at the FDA, including themselves, will then do a follow-up investigation in a structured way to determine as quickly as possible if we have a problem here. So the key number there is 1.7 million reports, and how do you triage such reports? And they do their best, and they have uh, systems in place, but these are all very manual systems. Uh, and still, as they come in the door, there's somebody looking at them quickly and kind of triaging them. So our FDA uh, collaborators, uh, Bob Ball and Scott Prostel in uh, Cedar, uh, said, you know, we've heard about this ma machine learning stuff that is going on in a lot of places, including Stanford and UCSF. Could you potentially use machine learning to triage these reports? Can we find features of these reports that indicate they would be high value of information versus less high value? Because given the limited time of our reviewers, if we could front load on the priority list the reports that are looking very promising as having potential signals of importance, we might be able to accelerate uh, our discovery of problems and therefore accelerate our addressing them and making sure we protect the safety of the, of the drug supply and, and, the, and the drug use. So we said, yes, we think that is possible. The key thing that they did for us is they, reviewers took some time out from their normal day jobs, and for 500 of these cases, randomly selected, they graded them. They graded them on a scale of one to seven. One through five is, one is of certain importance very valuable report, and then slightly less certain, and up to five is questionable importance. Based on reading this report, I don't know if I can conclude anything. Then number six is kind of an outlier. It means this was a medication error, so it's not really about the drug causing a problem. It's that they were given the wrong drugs. That goes into a different bin. And then number seven is a product quality issue. Uh, really, it's kind of a medication error of a different sort, which is that it's contaminated or something like that. And those are considered separately. So really what we care about is those one through five really valuable to not so valuable. And instead of having these reports come in in chronological order, which is what they, and be reviewed in chronological order, the opportunity here would be to have them come in, apply a classifier, which would then reorder them to have the attention be spent on the ones of most likely interest. Now, 
The question is, oh, and I forgot to tell you one thing. These reports also have a text field. So they have all those things that I mentioned before, and they have a text field where the person making the report can type in, this was a 43-year-old uh, person who was with depression who I gave this drug to, and their skin turned red, and w or whatever. So we thought this was a great challenge. The, 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 f technically, the challenge is, with 500 cases and five distinctions, one through five, we're gonna keep six and seven aside, we don't have a ton of data, and I'll get to that at the end. But we still were very grateful for their efforts in doing this um, uh, scoring. And so my student, who's an MD-PhD student at Stanford, Li Chi Han, uh, built um, a, a, a software, a piece of software that what we call featureized all these reports. So it looks at things like the, the, the uh, drugs that were taken, who reported, who made the report, what actual side effects are reported, how many drugs is the patient on. As you can imagine, if the patient's on 15 drugs, it's gonna be harder to do a cause-effect analysis for one of those drugs. Uh, whereas if the patient's only on one drug and you believe this is a side effect, that connection might be a little bit more reliable. Um, she looked, uh, in the text field, she looked at the number of words, is it a long piece of text or short, and a little bit about the type, which words appeared. Then we, uh, she plugged it into her, and I'm not gonna go into the technical details, for those of you who follow this, we, we did a random forest, which is a type of machine learning algorithm. Uh, and she ran it on a set of cases that they had also annotated, but we had not used in our training. So we train with about, we, we had 500 cases or so, we train for, with about three or 400 of them, and then with 100 of them that are kept aside, we use that to evaluate our performance. Uh, and with the performance, we, two things. The overall um, area under the receiver operator curve, which is a fancy way of saying 100% would be great and 50% would be random. We're at about 70%. So it's not killer perfect, but it definitely adds information. Um, so 70% overall performance. But more importantly, Leachy said, what are we trying to do here? What we're trying to do is reorder these versus having them just be reviewed uh, temporally. So she um, also looked at the enrichment for high scoring uh, reports and the 100 test cases. She compared what would be the um, average amount of time spent looking at uh, not so useful reports versus if we ordered them, what's the time spent looking at non-useful reports? And she found a very statistically significant difference there. So this is an important finding for us because first of all, and we're writing this up now, uh, we can say, look, you can get some signal in terms of which ones are valuable and which ones are not. Oh, I'm sure you're wondering what's important. So if the word death appears in a report, it's important. <laughs> That's a good confidence builder for us, that or, you know, at least we're not totally ridiculous. Uh, it actually turns out that the amount of text, the number of words, is helpful, uh, pretty much monotonically. I'm sure there's a point at which it's too much, but we, we haven't reached that. The types of side effects and the classes of drugs. It is not the case that all drugs have an equal probability of causing problems, and if you know you're in a certain class, um, it increases the likelihood that you might be talking about a side effect that is going to be important. And so, and then we have a list of these uh, about 15 or 20 features that seem to be very important. So this is great. Uh, we're writing an initial paper to discuss this. We're happy because we think that the tool, even as it is right now, could not do any harm, so to speak, in the FDA process. It would just reorder reports that they're going to look at anyway, but maybe in the morning from 9 to 11, they'll be looking at the ones that really uh, have this enrichment for signal. So that's exciting work, but what's really exciting is we wanted to get, I told you 1.7 million, we had 500. So we talked to our co collaborators and said, how can we get those 1.7 million? And first of all, they said, look, we're not gonna mark up 1.7 million on a scale, that's, we're not doing that. We said, we understand, but there are machine learning methods that you can apply where you don't actually know the answer, but you can still, with a lot of reports, get a sense for where the high value is and where the less high value is. Well, they said, Russ, you're a grantee, and as a grantee, we can't give you uh, the information because it has personally identifiable information in those little text blobs, and it would be very expensive for us to redact 1.7 million text blobs. 
So we were kind of at loggerheads and they said, well, but if you were a contractor, maybe you, you, then as a contractor, you're an extension of the FDA and we could get you these reports. So I learned about the federal contracting system and I wrote a proposal saying we have these preliminary results on 500 very expensively annotated reports, but we would like to get 1.7 million or, or 3 million over the last couple of years, um, please. Um, so the, the contract was approved. Uh, and so now we're in a new phase just getting started where we have tons of these reports, we have the text, uh, and we're starting to think, okay, we don't have though the labels from the reviewers, except for those 500. So we have this little puzzle of how do we take the, puzzle, the ones that we have labeled, the large volume of ones that we don't have labeled, and how do we try to improve the performance of the system? And as you can imagine, we have some ideas, and we're looking forward to the next phase of this work. So I think I'll stop there, and that's our little story about the Center of Excellence for Regulatory Science, and just one project that's trying to help the FDA um, with its throughput on looking at these spontaneous reports. Thanks.